in uh, climate change, but my background is in uh, geology. Uh, my undergraduate and graduate training was in uh, geology. Um, and so as a result of that, I look at climate change on long time scales, on uh, uh, tens to millions to, to thousands of years in the past. Uh, so that's what, what most of my actual uh, research is on. But today I'm not going to talk about climate change in the past. I'm going to talk about uh, modern and uh, future uh, climate change. <coughs> So I don't normally do this, but um, today I decided to start off by uh, giving you the story or telling you uh, the, the summary points. So the first point is we're changing the composition of our, our atmosphere, atmosphere through uh, fossil fuel combustion, uh, particularly greenhouse gases. As I'll show you, these greenhouse gases are warming our, our, our planet at a rate that is unprecedented. Uh, I'm not going to show you a, a slide of this, but the, the warming that we're going through now is faster than any time in, a, uh, in geological rec uh, record that we know of. The impacts of planetary warming are, are numerous and variable, and I'll give you a few examples of that, but there are scores of others that I won't have time uh, to talk about. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the cost of climate change, and I'll give you a few examples. I'm sorry my examples are mostly going to be Michigan-centric, uh, because that's where my focus has been recently. Uh, but the important point to know is that uh, the impacts of climate change do have a cost, and that that cost is going to increase with the future warming. And then, I'm not, I'm not a policy person, I'm not an economist, I'm not a political scientist, uh, but at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the fact that uh, we know what the solution is to slow or halt uh, climate change. Um, so we just have to take the first step and do that. And the most important step we can take is actually to pay the true cost of, of energy, all energy. And so I'll, I'll comment on uh, that at the very end. All right, so it's a great time to be a climate scientist. We have this natural experiment that we're conducting. I tell my, my students this. They don't usually sound very convinced. Uh, but we are emitting, or we did in 2013, we emitted 36 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That's a single year. That 36 billion metric tons uh, comes from fossil fuel combustion. 91% is from fossil fuel combustion and uh, cement production. The other 90% is through land use change, through uh, deforestation. This slide shows the increase, the exponential increase in uh, carbon emissions since the Industrial Revolution, which started in 1850. The black line here shows the total uh, emissions in metric tons of carbon per year. And you can see, if you look at the, the colored lines below that, that the contributions are mainly uh, through the combustion of coal and uh, uh, petroleum. Okay, so the, the source of this carbon is fossil fuel combustion. I, personally, I, I have a hard time conceptualizing what a metric, metric ton of carbon is. Um, so I found this great uh, website that, that visualizes carbon dioxide. And so here we're going to look at a city street in New York City. We have a cab for scale. Each of these spheres represents one metric ton of carbon dioxide. It's a diameter of 31 uh, feet. Each one of these spheres in New York City is emitted every 0.58 seconds. That gives you some idea of the rate at which uh, we're emitting uh, carbon dioxide. In an hour, New York City emits 6,000 metric tons. That's shown by this uh, little uh, hill. In a day, it's a small, out here we would call this a hill. In Michigan, this would be a mountain. <laughs> And then in a year, 55 million metric tons. And for those of you that have been out in Hoback, uh, out by Camp Davis, this is about cream puff, right? So we're about the size of cream puff. OK, so a tremendous amount of carbon is emitted just from New York City uh, in one year. And yet, if we compare this to the global emissions, it's not even a hill of beans. And so in this um, diagram, I've actually plotted the New York City emissions relative to global emissions. Can anyone see the dot? See it? Anyone in the front row? See, can't remember quite where I put it. Uh, actually, I can't see it either. It's right about here. Okay, so there's a dot there that represents the relative amount of New York City. And here's the global amount 
um, compared to that. Okay, to scale. All right, so we're emitting a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. As a result of that, the carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere, the composition of the atmosphere, is, is changing. And this plot is uh, from NOAA, and it shows uh, the, the concentration. Oops, I knew I was going to do that eventually. Uh, the composition in uh, parts per million. In 1960, the value was around uh, 320, um, and it's increased uh, by about 880 uh, since then. This next slide uh, shows carbon dioxide concentrations just over the last year. And it's pointing out that we have crossed some, some milestones uh, in changing our atmospheric composition. In May of last year was the first time uh, in modern history that the CO2 levels went above uh, 400 parts per million. Another milestone was passed this May. This May was the first month where the average uh, CO2 concentration averaged more than 400 parts per million. And we passed another milestone in the last three months because it was the, last, it was the first three month period that averaged above 400 parts per million. Things are changing. <coughs> if we take the long perspective, actually geologically this is more of kind of a, maybe a short perspective, intermediate to short perspective, but if we look at CO2 um, concentrations over the last 1,000 years, what we know from uh, measuring gases in ice cores is that the value was stabilized at about 280 uh, parts per million for about 1,000 years. And then along came the, the uh, Industrial Revolution, and the values uh, have increased to, to what they are today, uh, 400. If we do take a long view, we would have to go back about 5 million years uh, to get to the last time where CO2 levels were as high as they are today. Okay? So, so we're, we're really uh, in, a, in a new world. Okay, I, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the greenhouse effect. That I'm presuming that most of you are, but I, I think it's uh, worth going into a little bit of description anyway. The Earth's surface temperature is a balance between the incoming radiation from the sun, that's solar energy, and then the outgoing radiation that's emitted by the Earth. Okay, so there's a balance between this incoming and outgoing radiation. When they're in balance, Earth's temperature is stable. When that incoming and outgoing is out of balance, then Earth's temperature uh, changes. Greenhouse gases are changing that balance. So it turns out the greenhouse gases, and I'm talking mostly about carbon dioxide today, but this includes methane, uh, water, ozone, CFCs, uh, nitrous oxide. These greenhouse gases are transparent to solar energy. They don't interact with solar energy. It goes right to the surface where it warms uh, the surface. The uh, Earth's surface, because it has a temperature, then re-emits energy. But because the Earth's surface uh, temperature is so much uh, cooler than the sun's uh, temperature, it re-emits that energy at, at longer wave radiation. So we call it long wave radiation. And so the Earth emits long wave radiation back to space. If these two are in balance, Earth's temperature doesn't change. Greenhouse gases knock us out of balance because greenhouse gases don't interact with short wave radiation, but they do interact with long wave radiation. And so these greenhouse gases absorb, interact with this uh, long wave radiation, get excited, and then re-emit that energy. Some of that energy goes out to space, but some of that energy goes back to Earth's surface. Okay, and that energy back to the Earth's surface warms the surface. So greenhouse gases act as an insulating uh, blanket on Earth, causing the temperature uh, to rise. Okay, so we would expect, knowing this, we would expect that CO2 concentrations and temperature have a, a fairly tight uh, relationship. And you can see that that um, holds uh, for the most part. So this is uh, the carbon dioxide concentrations since 1880 uh, to about 2010. You've seen a plot similar to this uh, previously. The uh, blue and red bars represent the Earth's global average temperature. So it's as if we were to uh, stick a thermometer at the Earth and get its uh, full uh, temperature. And so what you see is um, blue bars indicate cooler than uh, average temperatures over this long period, and red equals uh, warmer. And so over the long term, over the last 130 years, 
uh, temperatures uh, have been increasing, and they've been increasing uh, in sync uh, with carbon dioxide concentrations. Okay. So we can do better than this, right? So we have one correlation. We have a correlation between CO2 and uh, temperature. But there are other fingerprints that allow us to know that carbon dioxide is uh, driving this temperature change. So one I already pointed out to you. A second one is we can actually look at the carbon in the atmosphere, the carbon that is uh, CO2, and it's consistent with a fossil fuel source. Okay, so we know that the, the uh, CO2 comes from this fossil fuel and we can identify that uh, chemically. The other uh, fingerprints that we have are the fact that the observed climate changes that we are seeing are consistent with those that we would expect from greater greenhouse forcing. Okay, so the pattern is consistent. So one example, nighttime temperatures warm faster than daytime temperatures. So if you look over the last 120 years, and we just track nighttime versus daytime, nighttime temperatures are increasing faster. And that's because in the nighttime, you still have this long wave of emission down to Earth's surface. And so it's causing a larger warming. Another fingerprint is that climate change is happening in the troposphere. That's the, the lower layer of the atmosphere. But in the stratosphere, the climate is actually cooling. And that's because the greenhouse gases are predominantly in this uh, troposphere. And so that's where they're absorbing the energy. And because they're absorbing this long wave radiation, it can't escape to the stratosphere. So the stratosphere cools a little bit. OK, so another fingerprint. <coughs> Other um, direct evidence comes from the satellite measurements. Can, satellites can actually measure the long wave radiation escaping uh, to space. And they can evaluate um, what that source of long wave radiation is. And I'll show you a slide of this in just a second. And we can also uh, observe radiation at the surface. And we see that the radiation at the surface has been increasing. And it's be, been increasing at wavelengths at which CO2 emits uh, at. So we, we have direct proof of a decrease in long wave radiation at the top of the atmosphere and an increase in long wave radiation at the Earth's surface. This plot shows that. It's kind of ugly. Contemplated whether to put it in, but I did anyway. Um, so this is the evidence from satellite measurements. And what you're seeing is a change in the brightness measured by a satellite that's measuring long wave radiation at the top of the atmosphere. And uh, the difference is from 1996 to 1970. So what this is showing is that there's less long wave emission in space in 1996 than there was in 1970, which is consistent with the fact that there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, and so less of that uh, radiation is escaping uh, to space. We can actually fingerprint uh, which gases, greenhouse gases, are emitting the radiation by looking at the wave number. And so what you see here is that uh, the, the energy emitted from CO2 is lessened. That's consistent with it being absorbed by CO2 in the troposphere. And you can also see that in the CFC range, uh, ozone range, and the methane range. Okay. Complicated graph. The point is less long wave uh, radiation uh, is escaping. If we look from the bottom instead of the top, uh, this shows uh, the long wave radiation, the wavelength of the or wave number of the long wave radiation that's observed at the surface. And again, we can uh, fingerprint where that long wave radiation is coming from. And what we see is that it's coming from the greenhouse gases, CO2, uh, CFCs, nitrous oxide, and methane. Okay. So we have direct evidence that the greenhouse gases are trapping this heat and re-emitting back to the surface. All right, so uh, I talked about global average temperature. I said the global average temperature has been increasing. It's increased by about 0 0.85, 0 0.8 to 0 0.85 degrees Celsius uh, in the last 130 years. An important point to make is that that warming is not uniform. And this plot makes that nicely. So this is uh, the temperature change of for the last decade relative to the 30 years from 1880 uh, to 1910. So average last decade temperatures subtracted from uh, 30 year average starting in 1880. Blue colors mean cooling, uh, yellow and red colors mean warming. And so what you see is that the, the surface of the earth 
is warming, uh, but it's not warming uniformly. The high latitudes are warming uh, more rapidly than the low latitudes. And there are even some small places where there's either no warming or even a tiny, tiny bit of uh, cooling off of Antarctica. Okay? So global warming doesn't mean uniform warming everywhere, but it does mean the aggregate that the Earth is getting warmer. All right, we can look, um, I'll show you a global view. We can look at just uh, US temperature changes, and these again are from observations, and they show a similar pattern. Uh, here, uh, the, the units are in Fahrenheit instead of Celsius. I'm switching back and forth just to keep you on your toes. Um, so this is in Fahrenheit instead of Celsius. But the same pattern, uh, there's large warming in the western United States, in Michigan, in the northeast, and there's less warming in the uh, southeast uh, United States. It turns out that Michigan is the third fastest warming state, if I remember correctly, uh, since 1960, and Wyoming is the 11th. So we're, we're, we're all exceptional. <coughs> OK, so surface temperatures are changing. One of the most fabulous, <laughs> exciting, um, maybe a little bit scary changes is the change in this Arctic sea ice extent. And this uh, plot shows this uh, nicely. Uh, this is the Arctic sea ice extent in September. And it's at, in September, the sea ice is at its minimum, so it's at its lowest point. And so you can see since 1978, there's a nice blue uh, trend line uh, put in here to show you that the amount of sea ice in September has been decreasing uh, through time. It turns out there, you, well, what you'll notice is that there's some ups and downs. It's not uh, flat. Sometimes it's a little above or below this line. What was really exciting in 2007 uh, for climate scientists was that there was an abrupt decrease in the amount of uh, sea ice. Um, and this was uh, completely unexpected. Then the sea ice recovered a little bit, and then there was an abrupt uh, reduction in 2012. And it's recovered a little bit. And if I was a gambling man, I would say that after maybe a year or two of recovering, it's going to uh, drop back down. Okay? So long term, a decrease in sea ice. Uh, this plot shows the actual sea ice extents. The red line is the uh, extent of sea ice in 1979. And then the white shows the extent in uh, 2012. Projections were, a few years ago, projections were that Arctic would be uh, sea ice free at the turn of next century, the end of this century. Now the projection is by 2050 or earlier. So, all right, um, so sea ice is changing, temperature is changing. If the temperature on land is changing, we would expect. Uh, ice on land, glaciers uh, to melt. We would also expect the ocean to get warmer and through thermal expansion to rise a little bit. So both the addition of water due to ice melting and the thermal expansion of water has caused, uh, in the oceans, has caused the sea level to rise. Since 1880, the rise is eight, um, has been eight inches. The projection is, it's, uh, there's a range on it, but it's up to four feet by uh, 2100. Even if, we, even if we're well below four feet, even if we're at two feet, that's major flooding of uh, coastal uh, areas. There's a number of sources for this data. Uh, the proxy data is from salt marsh data, and then the others are observations from tide gauges and uh, satellite altimetry. So ice is melting, temperatures are rising. Uh, the other thing that's, uh, that's happening is precipitation is changing around uh, the world, the distribution of uh, of precipitation is changing. In the United States, for the most part, precipitation events are becoming heavier. Okay, so we're getting a little bit more precipitation, but the precipitation we do get is in heavier, uh, larger rainfall events. And so that's shown in this upper plot that shows that the trends in heavy pre precipitation has been increasing by up to 40%. And then the bottom plot shows that distribution of uh, change in heavy uh, precipitation. So in, in Wyoming, it's a 16% uh, change. Of course, changes in heavy precipitation are important because it's the heavy precipitation events that give rise to floods, uh, lead to nutrient uh, transport into aquatic systems, uh, and so forth. OK, so now I'm going to take a, a little um, a side road here and talk just a little bit about 
uh, what's happening in Michigan and some of the unexpected economic uh, costs. And so um, the Great Lakes are seeing change. And somewhat surprisingly, the Great Lakes, Great Lakes levels uh, recently have been dropping. And you can see that by the fact that we have uh, uh, stranded uh, piers here, both in the Green Bay, which is at Green Bay, which is Lake Michigan, and Georgia Bay, which is in uh, Lake uh, Huron. This is a, a long-term trend of the uh, lake level, and so it fluctuates a lot. There's variability in the climate system and the lake system, that's to be expected. But since 1999, it's been persistently low. The um, theory for the hypothesis for this is that during the winter, the amount of sea ice has declined. And as a result of that, there's been a lot more evaporation uh, from the surface. And as a result, lake levels have fallen. This is, this is unexpected. This is the, the wonderful thing about studying climate, is that there are, there are uh, surprises in the system. You might expect, because Michigan in general is getting more precipitation, that lake levels would increase. But rather, it's the reduction in sea ice and the increase in evaporation that's driving uh, lake levels. OK, so this comes at an economic cost. And I'm not sure that I personally uh, wouldn't have uh, for, foreseen this. But shipping is, is a $34 billion industry in the Great Lakes. A lot of money goes to, into shipping. But it turns out that there are, the lakes generally are very, very deep, but there are passages between the lakes that are very, very shallow. There are also bays that are shallow. And so it turns out that for every inch that a thousand foot ship uh, like this one, Indian, uh, like this one, must sail light, 270 tons of cargo have to be uh, shed. So in general today, ships are carrying up to 15% less than they were uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Okay? So there, there's a cost to this, the lake level going down. Uh, there's also an environmental cost, which I won't uh, talk about. Ironically, uh, this freight was um, this freight that got stuck in the Indiana uh, Harbor, uh, sorry, got stuck in the Muskegon ch Channel, was actually delivering coal to an energy plant. <laughs> Um, other things have been happening around Michigan as well. In 2012, uh, there is a, a, well, spring is becoming uh, earlier, temperatures are beginning warmer sooner. As a result of that, the trees, the fruit trees uh, budded early. Then there was a, a cold spell uh, that froze the buds on the trees and essentially destroyed uh, the fruit crop. So the apple crop was down by 87%. The cherry by 80, 90 percent, peach crop 90. The U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, estimated the economic loss uh, between 225 and 250 million dollars. Okay. So you know, climate change comes has a cost associated with it. Some of it is easy to measure, and some of it is much more difficult uh, to measure. All right. The other thing that's been happening is that climate's been getting a little weird. Some, some climate scientists talk about climate weirding. And uh, one example of this was uh, winter 2014, this last winter for us. I thought I uh, heard a couple people, oh, John mentioned um, uh, this last winter in Wyoming. Well, let me tell you, if you go to Michigan and talk to a Michigan gander, they'll say, our winters are so bad. They're long, they're snowy, they're cold. They don't know what winters like are, are in Jackson or in uh, Helena, Montana. Their winters are mild and uh, wimpy. Okay. <laughs> until, until this last winter. This was the first. I've been in Michigan now for 11 years. This was the very first winter that I actually considered a winter by, you know, Rocky Mountain standards. Okay. So it was the snowiest winter in the Detroit area. Um, it was the snowiest single month, January 2014, with the snowiest single month on record. Um, it was the fourth coldest November to March period. Uh, and there were the most days, uh, it almost set a record, the third to most days with highs falling to exceed, uh, failing to exceed freezing since 1903 and 1904. Okay. The point is, it was cold and it was snowy. And if you had to shovel your lawn, shovel your sidewalk, uh, you remember it well. Okay, this shows the um, temperature difference from usual temperatures during January 2014. And so here's Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor is right about here. So we were about 10 degrees colder uh, than 
uh, normal. So we were nothing compared to, to Minneapolis, which is about 14 degrees or more colder uh, than normal. Okay, so there was a lot of talk when winter 2014 rolled around about, well, so much for those climate scientists. They don't know what they're talking about, do they? Global warming is over. Well, when you talk about global warming and you talk about climate change, you have to take the big view. You can't look um, small scale. You can't look over a month. You have to take the big view. And so this is the big view. This is uh, the temperature an anomalies for January 2014. Uh, relative to uh, a base period from 1981 to 2010. Okay. And so what you see is that, in fact, uh, the Midwest and even the Southeast was colder than normal. But California had the warmest winter on record. France had its warmest uh, winter on record, or January on record. And Alaska had the third warmest uh, January on record. Okay. So, and if you look overall, it was a period, again, of uh, overall warming. This is what it looks like in Alaska in January. Um, temperatures in, in January of 62 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, plants budding, moss, no snow cover. It looks gorgeous. Do you have any dog sledders in the, the room? <laughs> <laughs> this was the start of the Iditarod. They, they had considered moving it um, south, but uh, decided that there was enough snow, snow further north that they decided not to. Okay. So to understand this climate weirding of this, uh, this last winter, uh, we have to know a little bit about the jet stream. So what this diagram shows, the northern hemisphere, the colors and the lines represent the wind speed, uh, with uh, faster colors showing the larger wind speeds. And so the jet stream is this river of air. It sits about 7 to 12 kilometers up in the troposphere. And the jet stream usually sits between uh, cold weather to the north and uh, warm temperatures uh, to the south. Um, and the, the reason the jet stream is so important is because it steers weather events. And so it steers warm weather northward um, at ridges, and then it st steers cold air from the polar regions uh, southward uh, around uh, troughs. And in 2014, the jet stream got stuck, forgot where it's going, and it got stuck here over the Midwest. And as a result of that, it was uh, transporting Arctic air consistently into the Midwest region, um, the Great Lake region in particular. There's a lot of debate about whether this uh, the changes in the jet stream or just a freak weather event. Or there's some scientists that think that with, with global warming, because we're actually decreasing the temperature gradient uh, between this uh, warm temperatures and these cooler temperatures, that it might be that the jet stream gets stuck more. Um, and and I don't have a side in that, and I think time will tell. Uh, but there is the possibility uh, that this is a feature of uh, climate change. Okay, so wouldn't it be great if we had some tool for predicting future climate change? Well, it turns out we do. They're called uh, climate models. And climate models are um, software, pieces of software, that essentially describe all the math of the atmosphere, the land surface, and the ocean surface. Okay? You can think of them as really, really complicated, kind of boring video games. That's essentially what they are. And so, we, so the projections from the future are based on these uh, climate models. And so here I um, have uh, a plot that shows the climate models uh, that were used in the recent International Panel on Climate Change report. And if I remember correctly, there are 42 of them. So the first take home message is that there are a lot of these models. We don't rely on a single one. The second thing, and I, I made these small so that you could purposely not look at a single one of them. Uh, but if you look at them all, what you see is that they're all orange. I mean, there are some regions that are blue. But overall, each one of these shows, if you were to average over the entire surface, it shows warming. So these climate models were run for a scenario in which carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases were elevated relative to today. And every single one of these climate models, 
without exception, shows global average warming. There are regional differences that we can pick out, but uh, the global average temperature is uh, uh, warming. Okay, so if we want to think, so how, if we want to think about the uh, uh, uncertainty with future projections based on these climate models, uh, we also have to think about what we're feeding into the climate models. So the way we run a climate model is that we say, well, um, we know what the carbon dioxide and the methane uh, concentrations are today, and so we can put those in the model, and those give us a climate scenario. But if we want to know out into the future, we need to know how CO2 and these other greenhouse gases are going to change in the future. We don't know that. We, we don't. We have, we have guesstimates, and the guesstimates are shown on this diagram. So the black line shows uh, fossil fuel emissions from 1990 to about 2010. So these were observed uh, by the IEA. The rest of the lines are all scenarios. They're our best guesses. And the purple scenario is one in which uh, we, we have business as usual. So we continue to emit and do all the activities um, in the same way without any uh, increases in efficiency uh, that we have been. Um, and so as a result of that, you can see the CO2 emissions arise uh, until about, I can't read it exactly, but about 2075 uh, before it levels off. Okay, so that's one scenario. An alternative scenario is that we take action immediately. We're very aggressive. We reduce our carbon emissions. And so that by about 2030, carbon dioxide emissions uh, begin to fall. Okay. I can tell you right now that this is not going to happen. <laughs> uh, so right now, so th this is our business as usual scenario. And you can see that we're actually above the business as usual scenario um, that was started in 2010. So, so our trajectory is actually above any of these. I don't know if it'll stay that way, uh, but that's the way it is uh, today. All right. So this next slide shows the results from those climate models in which these different scenarios were fed into the climate models. And so the interesting part um, starts, uh, starts um, here when the scenarios start. And so the red line are the temperatures, the global average total temperatures uh, based on a scenario in which the scenario in which carbon dioxide concentrations were rising sharply. Uh, the blue line is the global average temperatures when the scenario was going down. So what you can see in these predictions is that the prediction is that global average temperatures by 2100 will increase anywhere from 1 to about uh, four, 4 four degrees uh, Celsius. <coughs> but these are based on those different uh, uh, predictions or uh, scenarios. The shading around each line is the uncertainty around the model. Okay. So this, this uncertainty is due to the models. This uncertainty is due to uncertainty related to what the emissions will be in the future. Okay. So now I'm showing you uh, spatial maps of these uh, same uh, model runs. Again, this is a case, this is a case uh, where we sharply decrease our emissions. It's not going to happen. But if it does happen, uh, the temperature change over Wyoming is about uh, 3 degrees Fahrenheit. If we go to the end member, this RCP 8.5, which uh, is business as usual, uh, temperature increases over Wyoming are on the order of uh, 9 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, mean annual, so that's over the entire uh, year. Uh, average temperature, uh, big deal. We could instead look at extreme temperatures, you know, which are uh, the temperatures that you actually feel on a, on a given day. And so what this uh, plot shows is the change in the number of extreme hot days. Again, for this low emission scenario and then the high emission uh, scenario. Um, it turns out that today, Wyoming, uh, or the Northern Plains, I should say, gets about seven days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Seven days. If this higher emission scenario occurs, that's going to increase to somewhere between uh, 28 and 19 days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I don't like to hike or even run above about 65. So, so if I seem particularly passionate about this, that's the reason, because <laughs> it's going to curtail my hiking. 
All right, well, it's not just temperature change. We can also look at uh, moisture change. And in general, uh, Wyoming and will get more high precipitation events. But because of the high temperatures, there will be an uh, increase in evaporation. So that it turns out the conditions will actually generally be uh, drier. And that can be shown here. This is the historical number of consecutive dry days, which a dry day it has a precipitation rate of less than 0 0.01 inches. Okay, so almost just a trace of precipitation. And so, um, so historically, Wyoming, uh, well, it depends where you are in Wyoming. It can range. Uh, this shows the change in the number of uh, consecutive dry days. And so parts of the state are going to have a three or four increase in uh, consecutive dry days. We can also look at uh, soil moisture. Soil moisture obviously would be important for agriculture. And again, it's the same uh, story that the prediction is, uh, this is mid-century change, so this is uh, by about 2050. This is by the end of the century. And the soil moisture in Wyoming uh, is going to uh, decrease by anywhere from uh, one to 15%. Okay. So this will have an economic cost because it will change uh, how agriculture uh, is done. All right, this is a, a, a summary slide. Um, I don't want it, you to necessarily take it literally because it's a little bit old. I think it's uh, five or six years out of date. But what it, what it shows nicely is the global temperature change uh, increase and the impacts of that global temperature change uh, for different sectors. So we could look at food, the food sector, for example. And with one degree uh, temperature change, uh, in the food sector, there is a possibility of rising yields. Okay? So with a little bit of warming, agriculture actually does better in, in, in some regions. Not everywhere, but in a lot of regions. In net, it does better. There are fewer frost days. Uh, the growing season is longer. So that's good. You know, one to two temperature changes is not terrible for agriculture. But once you get above about two degrees Celsius, then you get into the region where uh, crops are expected uh, to fail. We can look at uh, the water hydrological cycle. Don't, we, we already know the glaciers are disappearing. You can see the pictures on the, on, on the web. You can uh, hike up the Tetons and you can see that the glaciers are, are disappearing. Uh, that's with a couple degrees change. As you get to more and more uh, warming, then there are larger, uh, more drastic changes. It decreases water availability and it's sea level rise. Ecosystems. Because of ocean acidification, essentially some of that CO2 that is in the ocean also makes it into the, that's in the atmosphere, also makes it into the ocean and causes the ocean to be a little bit more acidic, uh, which is causing uh, organisms to have a harder time to make uh, and sustain their uh, shells. Uh, there's also a coral reef uh, bleaching. As this temperature goes up, the, the possibility of extinction goes up. I've already talked about extreme weather events. Another category is the risk of irreversible changes. And an irreversible change is, for example, the Amazon forest getting hot enough that it essentially dries out and the forest collapses. Okay, that, that's an example of um, an irreversible change. The issue with irreversible changes is they're very uncertain. There's a high uncertainty as to, to when and, and whether they will happen. Uh, but if they were to happen, it would be uh, 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 tremendously uh, damaging. It turns out that there that there's one irreversible uh, change that we think just started, or there's evidence that um, uh, this spring that has happened, and that is uh, the melting or the destabil destabilization of the Western Antarctic Ice Sheet. There are two papers that came out in the spring that said that the Western Antarctic Ice Sheet is, is melting, and if it, if the profile of the Western Antarctic Ice Sheet lowers. Uh, that uh, is a feedback and will continue uh, to melt. Okay. So we might be seeing one of these irreversible changes already. Okay. So how do we can curtail this experiment? Well, the answer is really, really easy. Uh, we reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions. We reduce uh, methane emissions. We reduce the other greenhouse gas emissions. It's easy to say. It's a whole lot harder to do in practice. Okay. And and so I've outlined uh, some points that I think most of us know. Uh, these aren't particularly new. Uh, we need to increase our energy efficiency in all sectors. And it turns out that the United States and the Western, the developing countries 
are actually doing a pretty good job of this. Uh, U.S. CO2 emissions actually stabilized and we're actually going down a, a little bit uh, re over the last several years. And that's mostly due to two things. One, we had a recession, but the other thing is that our energy efficiency is increasing. We need to continue to, in, uh, to increase energy efficiency. Um, you know, we can't get around this. Ultimately, we have to reduce reliance on, reliance on fossil fuels. This is a hard thing to say to a group in Wyoming. Uh, and, you know, I was damn scared to walk in this room. Uh, but ultimately, this is what's going to have to happen. We can just talk about the timing of it, and maybe we can put it off uh, down the road, but ultimately it has to happen. Uh, unless, magically, uh, we have some, uh, we create some technology that completely captures our CO2 uh, emissions. Possibly that could happen. So the other thing we needed to be doing is promoting carbon capture research and technologies. Uh, fossil fuels are easiest thing for us to get. They're abundant. If we could capture all the bad stuff that comes from them, uh, we should try really hard to do that. That, that would have the least effect on our economy. Uh, and then the fourth one, we, we have to think seriously about increasing nuclear energy, and um, we're already increasing renewable energy sources, but there's still a very, very tiny amount of the portfolio. Uh, these have to continue to increase. Okay, and so, um, so, so how do we get there? You know, one really important thing is that we, first thing we have to do is we have to accept the science and accept that climate change is happening. We can't do anything about it if we're constantly squabbling over is this happening and what's the cause. We know it's happening, we know what the cause is. Let's get beyond that and look for a solution, okay? And I was really alarmed, you know, Montana, Wyoming, very similar states. I have a close bond with Montana since I grew up there. I was really alarmed uh, when I saw this, uh, that the Wyoming legislature rejected the next generation science standards. And I, I don't know, I, not picking on Ron Michelli, I don't know him, uh, but, but he's the state board education chairman and he stated, I don't accept personally that climate change is a fact. The standards are very prejudiced, in my opinion, against fossil fuel development. This is coming from the education chair. My personal opinion is that this is wrong and that we should do the flip of it. We should be educating every single Wyoming student and say, look at the problem here. Let's go out and solve it. Don't ignore it. You go out and become the next engineer that learns how to do carbon capture, right? This is running from the problem. Don't run from the problem. That Wyoming young person is going to, to solve this problem for us. And also, I don't want to get shot. <laughs> OK. It, it's easy for me to stand up here and say, well, we need to do these four things. We need to reduce CO2 emissions. The history is that the transition from energy sources historically takes a lot of time. Uh, this is a plot that came out uh, in the Smithsonian uh, no, Scientific American uh, in 2013 by Snell. And, and what it shows is, uh, for each energy source, predominant energy sources, coal, oil, natural gas, and now the uh, modern renewables, the point at which that energy source was 5% of the energy portfolio, and then how long it took to grow to be a major portion of the portfolio. And so you can see in 1810, coal was 5% of the energy portfolio. It took 60 years for it to become 50%. Oil, petroleum, um, in 1915 was 5% of the energy portfolio, and in 60 years it was 40. Natural gas in 1930 was five, and it's, uh, 60 years was uh, 25. And modern renewables today are 4%. Okay? So the question is, is it gonna take 60 years uh, for them to become uh, an important part of the portfolio? And I hope not. And I think there are a number of things that we can do uh, to to promote them, promote them so that it doesn't take that long. Um, but you know, two points here. One is it's not going to be simple. Uh, second of all, if we follow this transition, um, it's going to take a long time. Okay. So the one thing we can do to really advance renewable energies, um, and I would throw nuclear in this as well, is that we currently that our energy sources are based on the visible costs that appear in utility bills 
And this system masks the social costs arising from energy choices. So when we burn uh, carbon, there are other um, consequences of that, including shorter lives, higher healthcare expenses, a changing climate, a weakened national security. Um, these, these are from, this is a quote by economists from the Brookings Institute. Okay. So if we actually pay for the to total cost of coal or petroleum, uh, the cost would be uh, higher. But I'm not promoting just paying for the true cost of carbon-based energies. I'm promoting paying for the true cost of all energies. Okay. And this, uh, for any of you that um, read the New York Times, uh, Henry Paulson had an op-ed just a couple days ago. He was the former US Secretary of the Treasury for the Bush administration. And he was arguing very, very strongly that climate change was an issue that we needed to deal with. And surprisingly, uh, he said, we need to craft national policy that uses market forces to provide incentives, incentives for the techno technological advances required to address climate change. That's not all that surprising. But this is, we can do this by placing a tax on carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, many respected economists of all ideological persuasions support this approach. So we're going to have to change the economic incentives or disincentives uh, for our uh, energy uh, sources. All right, so I have three kids. And last uh, weekend, we were hiking up uh, Phelps, uh, up to Phelps Lake. It's beautiful. And we stopped in the Rockefeller uh, Center. And I read this quote, and it, it really, really resonated with me. And so I thought I'd uh, share it. Probably many of you have seen it. But in ending, I'll say how we treat our land, how we build upon it, how we act towards our air and water will in the long run tell what kind of people we, we really are. Thanks. So I'll take questions now. Yes. You showed the example of the Great Lakes level being lowered because due to higher evaporation, which is based on higher temperatures. Why doesn't that apply to the oceans as well? There is more evaporation off the oceans, and then it rains over the land, and all that goes right back into the oceans. So there is a net increase in evaporation of the oceans. But there's also less water being stored in ice sheets, so there's actually more water in the ocean basins. So the hydrological cycle is speeding up a little bit. More evaporation, higher precipitation, but ultimately more river transport back to the ocean. When the ice is all gone, then it should balance out and maybe go the other way. No, but well, the, the amount of water in the atmosphere is minuscule. Actually, you could take that entire column of water and condense it all from the surface all the way up to the top of the atmosphere. It's measured in centimeters. It's tiny. Yes? Do you have a book that says all this? I don't have a book that says all this. <laughs> I can refer you to some books that say this. What about the impact to oxygen regeneration? Um, that, that is an issue. Um, there are more uh, anoxic, you could create anoxia. Um, the other issue is that it, the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere is actually uh, falling, but it's just so, so small that it's not really important. Uh, but, but locally, regionally, and, and water, um, local water, small water areas, anoxia is an issue. Henry related to Henry? Oh, no, no. Spelling is different. People try and spell my name that way, but um, it's the Danish spelling. It's P-O-U-L-S-E. So, spell different, yeah. How do you respond to, to all the reports over the last year or two that claim to show that the warming is essentially stopped? Yeah, I, I had the slides in here, and then I took them out uh, for time's sake. Um, I have it right here. Uh, so um, this, this is the temperature change. You've seen it in a graph like this. And the, the important thing I would say is that, yes, the temperature has been going up. Okay, you can follow the, the blue line to the red line. But if you look at it, it doesn't do it continuously. It doesn't fits and starts. And so for example, there's a warming period, and then there's a cooling. The warming, cooling. But there's a step case up. You go step, you step down a little bit, step up, step down, step up. So climate change is variable. No, 
no climate scientists expect that we will just continue um, monotonously to, to, to increase. But nonetheless, if you take um, that last 15 years, and if you take this highest temperature, what well, well, it turns out is a little bit of an anomaly because this was an ENSO year, but uh, El Nino year. But none, none, regardless, if you take this, you would see that it flatlined a little bit. Now, there are a lot of ideas for this, and the most persuasive one in, in my mind is that the energy is coming in. Well, if the energy is not warming the surface of the land and the sea surface, uh, it either has to be going out, and we don't see that, or it has to be stored someplace. And it can either be stored by melting ice, but that's a fairly small amount, or it can be stored in the oceans. And so what a number of studies have shown is that the, and this, again, this is the amount of uh, uh, energy, uh, and this is time, and these lines represent the amount of um, uh, energy at uh, different uh, depths. But what all these show is there's been incre times where the increase in the energy in the ocean has increased more rapidly. The uptake has increased. And so a very persuasive idea now uh, that's been shown from a number of studies is the ocean is actually uptaking that energy. We don't see it at the surface, but when we start measuring the subsurface of the, of the ocean, we do see uh, accelerating warming. So at some point, this will uh, stop, and then the surface warming will accelerate. Is there any sense of whether that's adequate to explain the level? Um, yeah, so um, the answer is yes. These studies say that it is. I, I can't be, I can't give you more uh, detail, but the, but the overall uh, summary of these papers is yes, this can explain it. Because the ocean, of course, has a larger specific heat, so it takes a lot more energy to heat it a little bit, just a tiny bit, whereas the surface of the, the um, land heats up very, very rapidly. And so you, you can store a tremendous amount of heat in the ocean and have a very small temperature change in the ocean. And so there are small temperature changes, but they're enough, it's not where I wanted to go, uh, to explain the warming. Yes? You were mentioning that recently, you were mentioning that recently we've been seeing warming trends greater than we've seen in the past. I'm wondering where the data for the warming trends in the past comes from, and just more information about that. Yeah, so there's a, a pretty rich paleoclimate community that uses a, a number of different um, indirect techniques for inferring past temperatures. One way is through ice core data and the, the isotopes, you can look at the oxygen isotopes of um, ice and from, infer from that temperature. Uh, but then you go back in the record tens, hundreds of millions of years, and they look at the geochemical signature of shells, even soils, um, and they infer uh, temperatures from that. There are more direct proxies, like you can look at uh, leaves and look at uh, fossils of uh, past leaves, and if you have um, I'm not a very good uh, botanist, but if you had a, uh, a deciduous tree in, on the top of um, the Grand Teton, for example, or a leaf from a deciduous tree, you would infer that it was warmer. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, fossil evidence that the temperatures were warm in the past. I can be more specific if you like. Yeah, I'd be curious. And I've seen some claims that the, the data has large gaps in, in it. Yeah. And, and yeah. I'm just curious as to whether or not, I, I was wondering if possibly those gaps melted out of the ice or whether those things were lost over time. So the ice core records are, are pretty continuous, but they only go about back for about 800,000 years. And then at that point, the ice sheets, the, the base of the ice sheet was melting. Any older ice would have melted because of the, the overlying weight of the ice sheet. So ice cores go back about 800,000 years. These other methods I was talking about can go back hundreds of millions of years. But then you're really, uh, the, the geological record is spotty. It's spotty because um, mountains are being built and destroyed and, and uh, surfaces are being destroyed. And so the, the, the geological record is, it has gaps in it. So, but we can piece together from those gaps a, a, a long history. Yeah? Your models uh, just make assumptions and you just blur it out there. And I'm really scared. You got us all scared. But I don't, I don't see the, the backup. It doesn't sh justify glaciers. We're in an interglacial period right now. And it, the CO2 thing doesn't explain why we have huge, a mile of ice 
over our head 10, 12,000 years ago, and today we don't. And, and then in 20,000 years, 40,000, whatever it's going to be, we get glaciers again. Uh, carbon dioxide doesn't, that I can see, explain that. So um, in the last glacial period, the carbon dioxide concentrations uh, were, what, were about 200 parts per million. So they were lower than they are today. The other thing that happens is climate is also dependent on the orbit, its orbit. And so there are times when Earth's orbit changes, and these changes are in the order of tens of thousands of years, so they're too slow to explain the warming of the last 100 years. But the glacials tend to be times where the CO2 is low, and the orbit is in a favorable position to grow northern hemisphere ice sheets. Okay? And so that actually explains very well the glacial interglacial variability over the last uh, 1.8 to 2 million years, both the CO2 and Earth's orbit. We can't call on Earth's orbit because the changes are too slow. NASA website shows the glaciers melting on Mars and on moons of uh, Saturn. And that your model doesn't explain that either. The whole solar system is going through a warm part of the, the galaxy, more friction, more energy. Energy hits us, comes from the sun, and, and from where we are in the Milky Way. We just went through, I, I read, uh, the galactic center. We are right in the middle of the disk. Thickest, most densest part, 27 degrees Sagittarius is where it happens. I'm, I, I'm read by astronomers. And uh, 500 years ago, the Thames River froze over. 500 years before that, so, they established Greenland. I mean, those, those, ideas, those ideas have been around a long time, and they keep coming up, and they keep being debunked. Because the energy, because the energy change that you would expect from going through a galactical arm, first of all, would be rapid. And second of all, uh, from what physicists have calculated, it's just the change is, is not that, that great. But I think it's the time scale that really determines it. If, you could, if we could spin through a galactic arm or whatever in 100 years, then I would be agreeing with you and I'd be investigating that and writing papers to nature and science. But the, the process is too slow. And the rate of this corresponds really, really well with the greenhouse gas uh, concentrations. We know where it's coming from, we know it's in the atmosphere, we know the physics of it. So Occam's razor is go with the simplest explanation. Yeah? Um, I mean, I've been in the oil industry and I'll say, I just checked your website, I came from Muslim, I guess, but Shell Oil, which is regarded as one of the most scientifically respected oil companies. A little louder, please. Well, they were arguing for the carbon tax as a necessary survival on that old blog and pony show. They were going around saying that we had to and the issue is our ability to get renewables and things like thorium reactors into the mix quickly enough so that we can reduce the consumption of fossil fuels. They retreated on their current website, but they, they had a fabulous slideshow absolutely supporting global warming and against their own interests. It's fantastic to hear. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'll switch to this side. So. <laughs> What are the what are the big users that uh, you know you can concentrate on for reducing their use of fossil fuels? Uh, is it jet planes? Is it eating homes? No, it's China. <laughs> You're out of work, China. Call us. Unless you drove here tonight. Yeah. Well, let, let's be fair, okay? I mean, China right now their their energy use is going up very very quickly. But let's be fair because China's energy use was not like that for the last 120 years. So yes, China is the biggest problem now, but historically China has not been the biggest problem. So we need to take responsibility for what we've done. But the, the biggest use of um, fossil fuels is in electric, electricity production. But that's the biggest one. I, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but it's followed by uh, transportation and industrial uh, uses. Yeah. Yes? Uh, you mentioned irreversible change. Um, I mean, in the history of the Earth, hasn't that been Yes. And I'm thinking of Sahara, Australia, and Homo sapiens is very clever. Yeah. yeah, irreversible here is, is meant on, a, on a, a, a human time scale, not a geologic time scale. Yeah. In terms, I mean, I have a geological background. In the big scheme of things, the Earth will be fine. <laughs> maybe not us, you know, maybe not pikas, maybe not, you know, some of these other species. The Earth will be fine. Yeah, it will recover. Uh, let me go back here. Yeah. Uh, I was two things. I was curious. You didn't mention any sources of 
greenhouse gas, if you will, from cattle and uh, agricultural, number one. Number two, you infer from the long wave radiation the, uh, the temperature and the carbon. Is that, is that, is that my? No, no, that's not right. Uh, so first thing about cattle is, I, to make this, the story simpler for me to explain, I focused on carbon dioxide because it's contributing the most uh, to the warming. Uh, but you know, cattle produce uh, methane in particular, and methane is an important greenhouse gas, very important greenhouse gas. One point that I, that I failed to make is that carbon dioxide uh, has a very long lifespan. So the carbon dioxide that we put in the atmosphere now will be literally be around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Your children, grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, their great-great-grandchildren will all um, be exposed to the carbon dioxide that we emit today. Methane's a different story. Methane is emitted, emitted. it's a very potent greenhouse gas, but it, its uh, residence time, its lifetime is shorter, uh, much shorter, decades. Uh, so, so we tend um, not to focus as much on methane. So your second question? No, I was curious, ultimately my question is, why do we need a new satellite to measure carbon dioxide if we can infer levels of carbon dioxide from your your reflective waves, and if my assumption is in, incorrect, please correct me. So uh, the results that I showed are from the satellite measurements that are actually quite old. They were from 1996 and 2000 era. But NASA, I think it was NASA, just put up a new um, satellite to measure CO2. But that's because the scale of the problem, that they're not interested in just the, the number, um, 400 ppm. But we can observe that very um, easily without putting a satellite. But they're very, very interested in understanding where CO2 is actually being emitted from, point sources of CO2, and then where it's being transported to and what is ultimate, uh, where it's transported. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of questions, uh, and we have scientists at the University of Michigan that study these questions, where their scale is very, very different. So that's what the satellite is used for. Yeah? Uh, did you say what the percentage of uh, human power CO2 is versus like background CO2? Yeah, so, so background CO2. CO2 is controlled on very, very, very long time scales of millions and tens of millions of years uh, by a weathering of rocks, right? So the, the CO2 emissions that I've talked, talked about are almost entirely anthropogenic. Yeah. Am I right in remembering that there are some Pleistocene very rapid temperature increases? Yeah, so right right now we're living in an interglacial. We're in one of these warm periods in the Pleistocene. The Pleistocene, and I was mentioning it um, uh, previously, the, the temperature went back and forth because of changes in Earth's orbit. And uh, CO2 is uh, was also changing. Decadal uh, change, I think. No, no, not decadal. Uh, these are on the order of thousands of years. Longer than that. So is that also responsible for mid Cretaceous? Do mid Cretaceous? Yeah. Uh, no, so mid Cretaceous is even a longer time scale, and uh, mid Cretaceous is due to uh, volcanic eruptions, large scale volcanic eruptions over a long time period. So, CO2, uh, volcanoes vent a little bit of CO2, but it's a very, very small amount, but over millions and tens of millions of years with large uh, background volcanic uh, emissions the CO2 levels in the Cretaceous were much higher than today. So the, the temperatures were much higher. Two more questions here, back there. Yes, when I, there, there's a phenomenon I can't remember what's where you, you, because of the melting ice, you have fresh water that's, that's uh, interacting with, uh, for example, the Atlantic currents, right? And between the salt uh, yeah. concentrations and all that, it potentially causes uh, climate cooling. Is, is there any evidence for that starting? So there? yeah, that, that's interesting. So these are that is uh, an example of one of these irreversible changes, and so the idea, um, very very poorly shown in the day after tomorrow, uh, is that uh, global warming would cause the shutdown of the North Atlantic deep water, and in the movie it caused New York City to freeze over and all of a sudden wolves to descend on New York City. Um, <laughs> So, so it turns out that, um, that regionally there, there could, for a limited amount of time, be a regional cooling. But we're talking on the order of a degree or two. We're not talking about the, the, the going into the, the next ice age. 
And the idea that uh, stratospheric air would be sucked down vortexes uh, is false. Yeah. Well, in the mix, and also capture, what is the state of the carbon capture technology? Yeah. What is the long projection of our ability to capture some of the carbon I'm not going to be a speaker all about that because that's not my expertise. I know that they continue to work on it. I know that right now the technology is very expensive. Uh, and that's the, the limiting uh, factor is the expense of the technology. Uh, but that's the best I can do for you. Yeah, the only technology right now that's commercially available is that it uses a, a, a litman oil called Selexol made by Shell. And you basically cool it down and heat it up at different temperatures and absorb CO2 and then when you heat it up it liberates it. Uh, that's the process that the Exxon uh, plant down at Shoot Creek uses. Uh, in 1995, the power bill per month was seven million dollars. So it's, it's not exactly a cost-efficient process. And the add-on to that is right now, as, as near as I'm aware, all the real research that's going on on CO2 capture is actually handling happening in China. They're pouring billions of dollars into trying to figure out how to do this because they really only have them. So they've got to try to figure out how to do that. If I may, two quick questions. You started off somewhere in there and you said five million years ago we were higher, it was either in temperature or CO2. CO2. Okay, CO2. Can you describe why? What was the world like then? Yes, exactly. That, that was the Miocene and the Miocene was a, a warmer world. There were why was it warmer? What's that? Why? Because the CO2 concentrations were higher. And there was no there were no ice on the, the northern poles. There was ice on, on Antarctica, but there was no northern hemisphere glaciation. So the other last quick question that Harry Larowski requested I ask you is do you have any knowledge in any of these charts I've never seen what's going on in the sun over the same exact period of time? Have you seen any charts yeah. like that? Yeah, I, I could put up a chart of sunspots, and sunspots have been a, a very popular, for a while, they were a very popular explanation uh, for the warming, because there was a while where you could line up the number of sunspots, and you could, if, if, you, if you change the axes just right, you scratch it just right, you stretch the temperature axis just right, you could line up the sunspots and the temperature just perfectly. Uh, and then over the last 15 years, <laughs> that correlation completely fell apart. Uh, there have been measurements of the energy change due to sunspots. It's too small. Uh, it, it, it's measurable, and in times like the ice, uh, the little ice age, it may have contributed. Uh, but over the last hundred years, it's just uh, simply uh, too small. Uh, it, actually, when when they run these climate models, sometimes they run them with the sunspot variations in it, along with volcanic emissions, and then they run the CO2, the background CO2 that we can observe, and they can actually then. Uh, play games and say, okay, let's take out the CO2 and let's only put in the sunspots and volcanic emissions. Can we explain this warming? No. You have to add the CO2 in, you add the CO2 in, and then it's, uh, it explains the record. So the sunspot is just too small for forcing. Well, I think a uh, very interesting and thought-provoking talk.